Hey guys, welcome back to Saturday Station Farm. So today, I've got Jamie from Seven Stands, Stands Farm yep. with us today. And we're going to be talking just a little bit about farming, a little bit about pigs. Um, so stick around and let's get started. Uh, so the first thing I've been wanting to know is why, how, where did the name Seven Stands Farm come from? Okay, so my son, we've had the name probably, I don't know, 15 years. Mm -hmm. It originally was Seven Stands B Farm. Okay. So my son was in uh, elementary school, and me and my dad were looking for a name for bees. We sell bees yep. and pigs and goats. Yep. So at the house we lived in, we only had seven hives. Oh. And in North Carolina, we call a hive a stand. Okay. I don't know if maybe in Maine you do or not. Or yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly... Yeah, it kind of been out of the bee game for a few years now, so I guess we would call them a stand. But we call them a stand of bees. Mm -hmm. So my son, mm -hmm. we're we're talking. My dad and myself are talking about what can we name our little business. Mm. Uh, and uh, my son says, "Well, you only have seven hives, so just call it Seven Stands Bee Farm, Dad." <laughs> so we started. That worked out well. Yeah. We were Seven Stands Bee Farm, and yeah. then when I got started into you know other things, pigs and goats, we mm -hmm. just dropped the bee, and now we're Seven Stands. But Okay. We still sell bees and queens and yep. nukes, yep. Uh, but... Now you're still doing all the... Do you still have seven stands or do you have more than oh, that now? We have about somewhere, it's according to our losses during the winter, but we're on <laughs> 60, 75 hives, something really? like that. Yeah. How have the losses been the last few years? We run a Varroa sensitive hygienic bee. Okay. We were in uh, studies with the USDA, USDA bee lab for yep. several years where they would send us semen and then we would have our queens artificially inseminated. Really? And uh, so their Varroa, they kind of sense the Varroa in, mm. in the uh, pupa okay. and they'll take the, the covering off and then destroy that pupa that oh, has really? the Varroa growing in it. So. They tend to do really well. Yeah. Last year was a horrible year because there was no nectar flow, so it was a really hard year, and we lost probably twenty percent. Usually, we're around that ten or twelve percent loss. That sounds like a bit. That. So you're still you still have varroa in the. Yes. Now, do you use like a, one of those white uh, inspection we don't, boards? We usually do like a sugar shake. You can do a powdered yep. sugar shake and determine. Mm -hmm. uh, but we try not to treat, so because of that, Roa, mm -hmm. the bee itself takes care of it. We try mm -hmm. not to treat very much at all. Jeez, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, no, um, my neighbor up the road, uh, he keeps bees. Yeah. And he said that a year or two ago, he started using, a, I think it was oxalic acid. Yep. That I guess he burns it. And he's asked me, because I'd never used it. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it's burned or if it's just kind of dusted or just put okay. in the hive to sort of fumigate that yep. hive. I'm not sure. And I remember it, and it, <clears throat> you saying it brings up because he was pretty excited that it was uh, relatively innocuous. You know, it wasn't uh, a real caustic chemical, yeah. that it seemed like it was pretty bee friendly yeah. for the most part, but it would knock down some yeah. varroa. Yeah. Huh, that's pretty good. So, do you also have, um, you mentioned the blooms. Do you have like really big peaks or is it more spread out when it comes to your nectar flows and blooms? Our nectar flow will start in March usually with our red maple. We have mm -hmm. a two or three weeks where that just gets the bees started off really mm -hmm. quick. We have a bloom there and then it kind of settles. And then around mid-April we start to get tulip poplar, mm -hmm. blackberry, clover, and holly's a big bloom yeah. for us too. So that's a really huge, we can actually pull honey from that flow. Really? Wow. So we have a spring honey flow. Yep. And that kind of dies down. And then about now to Ju the end of July, 4th mm -hmm. of July is usually the peak for what we call sourwood. Mm. And that's our preferred honey in, North, in my area of yep. North Carolina. Everybody loves yep. sourwood. Yep. Uh, it now, what is sourwood? It's a sourwood tree. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. What's, it's just a, what's it related to? I really don't know. Yeah, I'm I don't know sorry. if I ever heard of it. But it's a sourwood tree, and it has a little bloom. It almost looks <coughs> like a uh, a crow's foot or a chicken foot. Okay. And it's got these three little tails, and then there's a tassel of bells that come off of oh. each one of them. Huh. And uh, it kind of blooms from back to front, and oh. as it get, when it gets to the front, it's finished. But yeah. It's kind of got a little bitter bite at the end mm. of it, and it's really it's really a good honey, but I like the spring honey better. It's a little more sweeter. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So you get that going through the whole, up until midsummer. Yeah. 
And then is there like another big flow before fall sets Yeah, in? we have uh, mm -hmm. goldenrod. Oh, yeah, we got we that have, as well. Yeah. We have, uh, it kind of dies down and it'll go through a dearth period that's kind of pretty long. And then in the fall we have goldenrod, which is really fortunate for us. That really sets them up for the winter. We don't take any of that honey yeah. at all. Yeah. It kind of fills the hive so they'll, they can survive. Yeah. So. Now, I've done the same thing when I've kept them. Because you get that last, because part of it too is that goldenrod, we get kind of crystally. Oh, it crystallizes quick. You know, yeah. so I, I would leave that for them when I'd have them. Yeah. Now, so talk about winter. I spent some time in North Carolina, and of course, when I was there, oh, a decade ago, I guess now at this point, um, I don't remember much of the seasons, like as far as nectar flows. I wasn't too new mix. I wasn't keeping bees, yeah. and um, but the winters would get cold. I mean, yeah. it is pretty chilly. Yeah. Um, not like it is up here, but it still be chilly. So you're, you're, are the bees active, or are you still winterizing them? We're, we usually don't winterize them. We get cold, but we don't last. I mean, we might have a day where we're zero, but we're not mm. zero for a sustained time. Right. Yep. So usually the bees are able to take care of themselves as yep. long as you don't have too big a hive and too okay. small of a cluster. Yep. You kind of got to have that nice combination of enough bees and enough yep. small amount of space for them to keep warm. Yep. So we don't have to do very much with that. Mm -hmm. We will be warm up into November. We can still walk around with a sweatshirt and jeans a lot of times or a jacket. Yeah, I'm sure you're <laughs> you're like God. Oh, well, that fall weather when it gets uh, cold, that's good working weather. Yeah, you know, and yeah. you get your stuff. So just still, be, yeah, I remember some of the days down there where yeah. it was still like never got quite crisp enough. Yeah, and then you know we have <laughs> December, which is cold. Usually our coldest time is late December to end of February mm -hmm. and then we actually start warming back up again so yeah we have a short winter yeah. span in short comparison to, to yeah. you guys for sure so are they fairly because I guess what I'm wondering <clears throat> as well now I haven't thought of bees for a while right. um, but one of the problems we run to is like midwinter when it gets a warm spell they wake up yeah and then they fly about in, in winter and there's no reserves there's nothing you know they, they're going out to go into the bathroom yeah but then when they uh, come back in, they're trying to recluster before it drops again. Yeah. There's nothing really to forage yeah. on, so they're just burning calories. Yeah, exactly. Do you run the same thing down there? Is it? We do sometimes if we have a really warm winter. And yeah. a couple of years ago, we had that where we really didn't get cold. Yeah. You know, we got cold, but not like substantially cold. Yeah. And you have to really be careful that end of February, 1st of March, you'll have bees live all the way to then, mm. and then suddenly they starve to death because they've used all their winter stores yeah. because they're flying in and out. So yeah. we do have to watch and monitor that, and occasionally we'll actually have to feed yeah. uh, like a sugar syrup type uh, yeah. material. Just to, a little bit to get yeah, through. Yeah, just to get through till the nectar starts. It's not all that different than going through, uh, you know, having uh, a harvest in the fall, and then you put up all your stuff in your pantry, yeah. and you eat it through until spring, and it's like, oh, spring growth, but there's still another four or six months before crops are coming up exactly. again. Exactly. You know, like yeah. You're not quite there. Feels like you're out of the woods. But you get a long way to go still. Exactly, yeah. And that's yeah. what a lot of people lose their bees, like in that month of March, it's starting mm -hmm. to warm up. Oh, we see them flying, they're mm -hmm. going to live, they made it, and then they go back in two weeks and they're dead. Yeah. But yeah. they're dead because they starved. They had, you know, had made it through the winter, yeah. but then when they start working a little bit, mm -hmm. they're burning extra calories and just gone. Yep, that yeah. sounds right. So you've got your bees, you're trying to keep them going. Yeah. Um, and you've also got your pigs. Yeah. Um, and we also do meat goats. And the meat goats, that's yeah. right. It wasn't sheep, right? And I saw um, some of your videos before. It was all goats, yeah. Yep. We do all goats. How are you liking them? I like the goats. Really? I had the goats before I had the bees. Okay. Uh, so, no, I had the bees before I had the goats. Excuse me, yep. I'm sorry. No worries. So, uh, and then we had the goats before we had the pigs. I really like the goats. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of a steep learning curve with parasite mm. control and how to move and kind of without trying to take care of them without just doing a consistent treatment. A lot of people do it every month or every two months they'll yep. worm, but yep. I try not to do that. I don't, sure. I don't really like that. Yep. I do use yep. commercial wormers when they need it. Yep. yep. But I go on the health of the goat. We do a Fumacha mm. score. Okay. Which is testing we look at their eyelid to mm -hmm. see if they're anemic or not oh. and the barber pole worm usually sucks enough blood away that you can kind of tell that they're 
they get really pale, just like a person who would lose blood. Oh, really? So then we worm and yep. we treat and uh, take care of those at that time. Only mm. treat when necessary. See, that's kind of the way. Now, does that, um, how do you, do you have, you get, you go, now I get a bunch of questions for you. I got gotcha. you. So you go off onto uh, pigs. Yep. Now, do you have a concerns veterinary-wise or treatment-wise or anything you do special for the pigs? Usually, I worm them at their at weaning. Mm -hmm at about six weeks to eight weeks, whatever their weaning mm -hmm. time is. And I, if they're for my feeders, I don't, I haven't had to worm them mm -hmm. again. Yep. Uh, yep. Because they're in a large enough space, they're moving through paddocks. And yep. so yep. I, I, I think that's a real stressful time at, at mm. weaning and they sure. get that bloom of parasites. Yep. But, but other than that, I don't, I don't yep. treat, unless they're sick, of course. And that's kind of my philosophy on it as well. Um, I haven't given a warmer uh, in quite a while, uh, mostly because I haven't seen any anemia or anything that really makes me think that uh, there's cause for concern right. as far as warmers go. Um, I have no problems giving a medication to an animal that's sick and needs it right. you know, to get through. Uh, however, just a proactive, you know, preventive, just giving it just because. Yeah. Um, I've never been up for that. Yeah, I don't. I don't like that either. I mean, people are saying, "Do you use antibiotics?" Well, I don't just routinely, but if I have a sick animal, I'm going right. to take care of it if it mm -hmm. needs an antibiotic. Just mm -hmm. like if I get strep throat or something, I'm going to take an antibiotic right. because it's proven to work. You yep. know what I'm saying? There's a time and a place for everything. Exactly. And I think that uh, <clears throat> thinking about that as well. So with the pigs, they're always going to have a certain level of worms, no matter what. Exactly. Like they're just they're in the environment. They're going to be there just in the same way that the bees and the varroa. There's a certain level of tolerance that they can, you know, it's like when the varroa gets too high, it upsets the ability for the hive to outcompete it. Right. And that's kind of how I've always felt, you know, especially when you have a, with the pigs with a, a rotational system. Yep. Some way you can break those parasite cycles. Um, and the other thing that I've looked at doing for pigs is actually starting to take fecal samples. You know, like, certain times of the year where I have a data set. Because yeah. it's what's really gonna happen, I believe, is it's gonna build up in the system. You know, so you may have an individual that has them in a, a, like an acute point, yeah. but not necessarily representative of what's going on across the whole exactly. area. Um, have you messed around with any of that stuff yet? I've done fecal samples with goats, okay. but I have it in the, in the pigs. Yep. I just, yep. But I have used the fecal sample along with the FAMACHA score and the yep. goats. And I think uh, we talked about it earlier in kind of talking about our breeding stock. I've seen uh, goats that function fine with a high fecal sample, okay. and then you've seen goats that function are almost dead with that same mm. count. So the visual variability. It there. is, and so yep. you kind of choose those animals that can handle and mm -hmm. contain that higher load. Yep. For yep. your breeding stock. Hundred percent. Now, so, so you're breeding your goats. Yeah, yeah, we yep. breed. We've got a registered herd of myotonics, which is a fainting goat. Okay. But they're the yep. large meat goat size. Okay. And then uh, we just started a commercial herd too with a savanna. A savanna. It's kinda like a, it's a cousin to a boar. You know the red headed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They grow a little faster, a little. You know, I won't say meteor, but they're faster growth rate. Yep. To hit that commercial market. Hmm. So none for milk? No, we don't do the milk. We can milk the myotonics. They're kind of a universal, they're sort of a okay. heritage breed. Yeah. You yep. can do that with them, and we've yep. tried it, but that's a that's a big commitment, like you say. <laughs> it, that's the thing that we don't we don't have time for. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you and your wife are working full yep. time. Yep, we both teach high school. Yep. And uh, run the farm in the afternoon and off during the summer. That's a lot of time right there. So uh, how long have you been teaching for? I've been teaching high school, this is I think my 11th year. Wow. My background is uh, emergency medicine. Yep. I was 10 years as a paramedic and 11 years as an ER nurse. Yep. And this position kind of opened up at a time I was sort of burnt out of emergency <laughs> medicine. So I stepped into teaching and yep. I actually love it. That's cool. Yeah. So how much longer do you, do you have an end time frame for teaching and going to the farm or like? I would love. You haven't burnt out yet. <laughs> no, I haven't burnt out yet. Uh, I really don't know. I yep. mean, I would love to be able to quit tomorrow. I think and mm. and go to farming. Sure, sure. But then sometimes I think the 
you know, the responsible side of me is like you're eight years from a 20 year retirement and sure. should you stay or should you go mm -hmm. kind yep. of thing, you know, so I really don't know. I want to go to farming Yep. and I don't want to be irresponsible mm -hmm. and leave, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm kind of in that catch 22, yep. I'm not sure. I don't think you're alone there. Yeah. I, I think a lot, and I, I think I was, and I'm still in that for a long time where, um, you know, I still have my, my off farm business. Yeah. I have a, another business my small right. so I have to kind of do both and the off-farm business has um, helped fuel my infrastructure yeah. and to get my my systems in place uh, but at the same time like there's a lot of days where I'm up on a roof you know I'm under a deck yeah. I'm like oh I could be back on the farm playing with the animals yeah. kind of something. exactly um, but you know that eight years if you can continue to work out those kinks and reinvest into it and then get into a great um, I think that from my point of view, is the smart way to go. Yeah, I think so too. You know, just yeah. but a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of folks that have uh, gone uh, for one reason or another. Now they've left whatever professions they have, and now they're full time farming. Yeah. Um, and a lot, I see a lot more that have are doing more homesteading, where they've said, okay, now we have less income coming in, so there may be a small component that they're doing it commercially, but the majority is their own sustenance. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, you, but then you've got the gardens, yeah. and you've got all your ant meat animals, and that whole, it's a whole big time commitment. Yeah. It's hard to do everything. Yeah. Um, so I guess slightly, I'm kind of curious, back on the bees, are you selling all the, like, honey and comb and all that stuff at the farmer's market when you're going? No. Now, we sell, our main product with the bees mm -hmm. is the bees themselves. Just, okay. Yeah, yep. we sell nukes, yep. which is like a starter mm -hmm. hive, and we sell queens. So. Gotcha. We do end up, of course, with a byproduct of honey, mm -hmm. uh, especially mm -hmm. during the sourwood because most of our bees are sold early in the spring. Yeah. Uh, so we raise all our own queens, make all our own splits mm -hmm. into nukes, get them built up, and then we sell them to customers. I get to look up the sourwood and find yeah, out. Yeah. I'm super curious about yeah. that for now. And uh, I'll have to, s if we have a good year, I'll mail you a, yeah. I'll send I'm, you a uh, bottle. Well, of, I'm, I'll take that for sure. Yeah. But I'm super curious about the tree yeah. itself as well. So is there like a, um, I mean, a uh, more Varroa var uh, resistant queen sound, but is there like a northern version? Because I'm not so sure, that's one of the problems you had before is you bring a southern bee up that's not really yeah. acclimated and you, you're and just we, setting it behind the power. Yeah, yeah exactly. And we, we find that we sell a lot of our bees to that North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee area, mm. which is They've mm -hmm. been buying those bees from Florida, Georgia, mm. that they can get early, yep. and they're not surviving because of yep. the climate. Well, most of the ones we get up here that way, yeah. they'll come up from Florida. Yeah. So you know, or Georgia, they'll you know, bring them up by truckloads, and you, especially if you're buying packages. Exactly. You know, if you're buying packages, that's what you're getting, it's generally a southern yeah. bee. Yeah. Uh, if you're getting nukes, then you're generally getting somebody that's overwintered them, and, they're, yeah. and yeah. that's what you get. So, uh, we... Uh, <clears throat> I don't know as far north here as that mm -hmm. if there is. I mean, I would hope that our bee would be a little more acclimated to cold weather mm -hmm. than say a Georgia bee would. Mm, I would you know, think so. You know, they get exposed to it. We ship queen. We've shipped queens all over the U.S. Really? So, yes. But I don't know. No. I know that there's a beekeeper I follow on YouTube. I can't remember his name out of Canada. Yeah. That sells. Um, he sells a bee. There's a name for it. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, but yeah. anyhow, hey. Well, I mean, now, you know, I've been out of the bee game for, I don't think, I think maybe four, three or four years was probably my last. Yeah. You know, and we'll, see, we'll have swarms show up. I mean, yeah. Neighbors got bees that are around, yeah. and I've been kind of like, you know, if I capture a swarm, I'm all in, but I, I just haven't dedicated the time to get them um, talking to you about it. I kind of want to get my bees going yeah. again, because I miss them. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're wicked they're fun. They're an amazing creature, and they're yeah. fun to work with, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love them so much. But that'd be my concern is getting them from the south again. Um, like that's why I kind of went and bought packages. Yeah. Because my uh, success was maybe fifty percent. Yeah. You know, you'd have wins and losses, and then yeah. sometimes it was like, well, do I insulate or do I provide more ventilation, yeah. or do I not insulate? You know, there's a whole bunch of things to look yeah. at going into it. And I said, well, I'm just saying, once they died off that last time, I was like, well, if some show up, it was meant to be, and I'll continue with it. Yeah. And if not, then. Yeah, of course. You know, but having something that's a little more hardy out of the gate would be. If you could find you a swarm or a package, you could always order you a queen from somewhere that's more just that's acclimated. Right. Yep. And then, you know, after about six or eight cycles, you yep. know, a few 16 weeks or so, she's been taken over. 
are all her bees anyhow. So yep. that's a good way to think about it. Well, that may be. One bee. You know, this it's late in the too late in the year now yeah, to get started. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but you know, coming next year, you know, think about that. Now that there is uh, the potential for a much more varroa resistant uh, queen in that yeah. trait going on in the box. Like, well, the success rate is likely to rise. Yeah. You know, or if somebody is actually out there listening that wants to uh, get into bees, yes, that's a good option. Because yeah. when I kind of get into it, um, so I got out of the military a decade ago, and I kind of started getting into bees, and, and that was a, uh, Russians were really popular, yeah. trying to bring those over and trying to find that, um, but it sounds like it's, it's definitely developed since I've been yeah. like, not paying attention. We more. started with some Russians and the, the Varroa sensitive hygienic mm -hmm. BSH to see which one was more mite resistant. The v, the Russian were as mite resistant as the VSH, but yep. they were they were intolerable. Oh, I mean, they were really the ones we had. They may not all be like that, but especially if they ever swarmed one time, they were super mean. It was just hard. <laughs> it they makes were, a lot of work. Yeah, well, it's well, that, not pleasurable beekeeping at all. Well, so. that's like we get the, the hives down there, and they're just far enough away where they're not bad. But once that population gets high enough. Now they're up here. Yeah. You know, and I need my livestock, whether it's bees or any cats, the dog, yeah. the pigs, they've got to be, uh, they've got to be gentle. Yeah. You know, they can't Absolutely. be aggressive. Especially we got, you know, kids walking around yeah. or strangers. I, you know, I come home one day, um, you know, it's some, happen more than once. You come home and folks are just over by the pigs hanging out. They like, <laughs> don't know where they are. They're just like, oh, we saw you at our farm. We thought we'd just stop by. Yeah. You're know, like, uh, you know, like, if no one's been hurt, thank goodness. And I hope no one ever is. But you just never know you if never you had. Know. You know. Exactly. Um, I know I'm kind of jumping around oh, a little bit, <laughs> but so a lot of people will say, "Hey, you get goats." Ah, I'm sorry, you got pigs. You should get goats. Yeah. <laughs> and I've never been attracted to goats at all. Right. But this past year, mm -hmm. my lawnmower broke, <laughs> so I've been kicking around the idea of getting goats yeah. or sheep. Um, kind of tongue in cheek. Yeah. Um, usually, I start looking into it, and that high what sounds like high maintenance like the the parasite stuff yeah having to take care of them um, you said there's a steep learning curve to them there is originally yeah so let's say i wanted to get like two goats right like a little homestead you know, i just want a couple of them maybe i'm going to raise them for um i want to get them in the spring i want them to mow my lawn and then i want to get rid of them in the fall well how would you suggest starting out I would, find, I would find somebody who raises goats mm -hmm. definitely like you want to raise them. Yep. That, if I can give any one piece of advice is buy your goats mm -hmm. from somebody who raises them like you're going to. Yep. I've bought, you know, I have this registered herd and I want to try to get bigger and muscular and all this. Mm -hmm. So I buy goats from somebody that does mostly show goats. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> and bring them home and they'll lose 30 or 40 pounds in sure. you know, just no time. So yep. if you buy a goat from somebody that has a homestead that kind of lets them out, that they're, yep. they're not off hand, you know, that they still take care of them but and look after them, but they're not having to baby or coddle them continuously. And that's, that's what I need. That's what you need. Yeah. See, that's why the pigs are great. Yeah. I mean, they're pretty resilient. They, uh, if it weren't for feed, they wouldn't really need me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I always say an awful lot that uh, pigs are like dogs in their mannerisms, but they're also kind of like cats. Yeah. They don't really need me. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's some times that they're off, they're just strong head and doing their own. And so, um, how, so I guess out of curious, how are you containing? Your goats, because that's one of the big things. Is they're they're worse than pigs as far as escape artists go. Yeah, I hear that constantly, and I have half of my pasture is just woven wire fence, uh, like the electric net. Kind no, of I actually have built. I've got about six or seven acres that's fenced in. Okay. Half of it is like the the tractor supply red brand, you know, the oh, point squire. The metal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got some. Idea. And then I started doing some research and. Uh, I, I put up high tensile, just electric. Okay. I, I run uh, six wires. I run six, twelve, three sixes, and then seven, eight, nine, which gives you 42 inches. Yeah. And I electrify all of them. Yeah. And I don't have any trouble. I just put a nice charger on it. And, yeah. You know, it's really, I'm, it is an expense, but I think if you were going to do a couple of goats, electric netting would be fine. Yep. Because yep. okay. that would be the thing, like yeah. six wires. It needs to hit my front lawn. It's gonna hit my back lawn. Yeah. I want to run them down the ditch. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can. 
for two goats, yeah. I'm, but I'm running 50 or 60 sure. head. Right? Yeah, 100%. So the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the electronating would work wonderful. Um, you ever, like, tether them? Like, I have not. No? Nope. Uh, and, you no know, experience with that. I mean, and there's surprisingly not much information. It seems like I remember like older. I mean, it used to be much a, a much more common thing. Yeah. But when you go to YouTube and look for it, I just found very little information. Yeah. And, and probably I'm guessing because of scale. Yeah. You know, it becomes super impractical to be tethered a bunch of individual goats yeah. when you have even above like four or five. It's right. like okay, well, this is let's have a, a pen. You yeah. Know, keeping them down. Exactly. Um. Yeah. See, that would be because that was my thought is I could just tether them. Maybe bouncing them around where I want, put them where I want. Um, but then there's all that extra movement and maintenance. And, yeah. Uh, if you had a permanent setup, that makes sense with yeah. a, a physical barrier. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like it's a lot like pigs because people always look at uh, pigs as escaping. Yeah. And I've always said that if if pigs are escaping, it's a management issue. Yeah, they don't have yeah. something to eat. Yep. Usually. And they want to get out. Yeah. They like they the desire to cross that negative influence is strong. Yeah. They're like we want to get out. Yeah. But like when you're running them on a pasture and they're always on fresh ground, they have that novelty, they have the stimulus, they have the food. Yeah. Like the grass is greener on the inside, why would you want to put exactly. yourself to that risk? Um, so what are you running for your fencing for pigs? I use uh, like a poly braid. Oh, the, uh, yeah, yeah. The, um, not, um, I think you use like a 14 gauge, looks like mm -hmm. this. Yep, or I, seven, somewhere in that neighborhood, whatever's, yeah, whatever. in the, whatever's on the shelf. But I just use, a, it's like the poly braid, the poly yep. wire with some electric, and the same fence post you do. I love yep. those little fiberglass posts. Yeah. Because they don't conduct electricity. If you get the wire pops off against the post, you're not grounding out the whole fence. Yep. So I yep. really, that's, I use, on my perimeters, I use two wires. Okay. Like a six yep. and maybe a twelve or something. Yep. Because yep. I'm always moving younger generations through. If I was only yeah. doing always yep. constantly yep. older pigs, I would probably just use one wire. Yep. And I've got some yep. spaces that I do that, but mostly two wires and then my cross fences are usually yep. one. So are you getting them your piglets trained to wire before you take them out? Yes. Yeah. I do a. Uh, how, how do you set, how do you set that up? I set up a 16 by 16 using the pig panels, mm -hmm. a four square, 16 square. Yep. Um, and then I'll do two or three sides of that. I'll put in a piece of short piece of poly wire around mm -hmm. a couple of three sides. Yep. And just electrify it really hot. Yep. And yep. I found that 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 physical barrier behind mm. the electric fence. They run into it and they can't yep. go through, so they have to back up. 100%. And they kind of train to that backing up from the electricity. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, you'll see a lot of times, too, I'm sure you've seen where they even just have, they might not always see that rope, but because there's like a physical wall, they pause. Yeah. And that gives them time to be like, oh, what's this? Yeah. And they gum onto it. And, and then boom. They, they say, go. oh, this is negative. Yeah. <laughs> Back over here, where the yeah. treats are. Yeah. yeah. So I run that about anywhere from a week to two weeks, and then I'll open them up. And it's just kind of according to what my time schedule, <laughs> honestly, yeah, I get that. You know, what my time schedule works out to. So a week or two weeks, yep. you know, and then I let them out and that usually I'm not really had any trouble. So you get the two lines, what are you doing for fence maintenance? Are you getting grasses growing up into it? We do. Uh, I just try to run a really hot fence. Or, yep. uh, and I've got some really strong back nephews that I pay to weed. <laughs> <laughs> a weed eater kills my back, so uh -huh. I, I pay them to do some weeding yeah. on occasion if I need to. I get that. I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm allergic to rakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Every time I just start raking that pull, for whatever that pull yeah. just rips my back apart. Yeah. And that's what I've got out here. You know, I use the uh, 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 Husqvarna trimmer. Yep. You know, and go through and hit the line. It's nice and easy, and yep. it goes. A couple times a year, especially yeah. now where it's growing. Right mm -hmm. now, a lot of the grass is going to seed heads, yeah. so it's slowing down, and I'll knock it down. Yeah. Or I'm having to adjust the fence line all the time. Yeah. Um, and I love those poles too, especially the ones with the, the yellow conductors. That's what I use to screw on the yellow conductor oh, for that. So easy to adjust. Yeah. They've got those other ones. Actually, I was kind of complaining this morning. We had that the hen that was stuck in the barrel, and uh, there was wire and fence poles that those those uh, gray ones with the black hooks that are predetermined. And they were hanging up, and I'm trying to get the wire out without oh, like yeah. hurting the chick. And yeah. it's just like, I hate those I things. I started out buying them thinking, man, that'll be great. Yeah, they're stick right in. And uh, <laughs> they're never at the right height. Nope. Never. So I stopped using them and yep. used the, the the fiberglass post with nothing on it and yep. then used the screw on the insulator. Yep, that's the way to go. Yep. It'll save a lot of people a lot of problems. Yep. 
yeah, I think about that, that two strand. I've got some spots I've got two strands, and uh, and it works well. I've kind of kept them up, but you, you know, if it's not high tensile, where it's kind of like drooping sometimes, and you get maybe the bottom line gets a little bit tighter than the top, yeah. or and we'll tie up to trees a bunch, so sometimes it always shifts a little yeah. bit, and so I'm, I'm moving more and more to just single strands, and the majority of the farms are single strands. Yeah. Um, just for that maintenance piece long term. Yeah. yeah that's kind of the way that I've set it up now. So you mentioned also before that you, you've got hills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how big of an area do you have set up for your pigs' uh, paddocks or, or overall? We moved to family land and my grandfather owned like 125 acres mm -hmm. or something and we bought a little corner of six acres and I was raising a small scale of pigs and the guy let me put them there so he got tired of them being there and we moved them. So my uncle now that owns that property, we have no pastures, we're all woods and hills and trees yep. and forests. So I'm probably running, I'm not good with, pro I'll say I'm running six to eight acres yep. that's fenced in with multiple paddocks and yep. it just kind of runs a ridge line. Okay, and I'll start them on one end and finish them on the other. So you're like you're running like the your fence lines uh, yeah, the on the contour. The, yep, top yep. of the ridge to the like, kind of the bottom of the ridge. Oh, so from the top to the bottom. Yeah, and so, I just kind of stay right along with the ridge contour and and that one area, and I've just got it divided into four or five paddocks. So your your paddocks, um, you know, you have vertical. Segregations versus like a horizontal like contour line. Yeah. Okay. Are you seeing any issues with erosion? Mm, in a couple of places, then it's Some my sure. fault because yeah. I left them too long. I didn't move them quick enough, so it's know. been a learning like, curve, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I will say I've had a, a little bit of erosion, but as long as I keep them moving yep. and go behind and see yep. a little bit, I haven't really had any trouble. That's, and that's yeah. one of the tricks that I run to as well. Um, I. Can, before I go too far, I can't remember. Does the ground free? The ground freezes up. Yeah, yeah, some, it freezes right? up. Yeah, I mean it won't be for months at a time, but we'll have some time that it'll freeze up for a week or something. And usually it warms up and thaws. So yeah, we have that trouble with freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw. Sure. Yeah. Now, so you, I remember you mentioned it when we were talking about the bees, but you start having grasses coming up probably in March. Yeah, end of, end of March, 1st of April, getting we're into really that. getting into that. Yeah. So you get some growth. Because yeah. that's one of the problems I run into here is when you when the ground is frozen, uh, the pigs are out there fine. Right. Uh, they're not doing any damage to the, the ground. But once it melts, there's like a two-month window, roughly, where they're doing damage to the ground, but nothing's growing. So it's yeah. just becoming muddier and muddier. Um, and the trick is to try to bounce them. Um, I kind of like... When I see roughly about 30% uh, of the soil turned over, I like to bounce it so that whatever's left behind it just grows back faster. Yeah. But that's kind of a hard, you know, generalized yeah. image. Um, I think here we, so there's some very defined times in the spring and fall, a couple months where it's like, we're just going to turn into a moonscape and then I have erosion potential issues. Yeah. And I definitely, have, especially around like sacrifice areas where they're around a lot, yeah. that's a big issue. Um, and so that was my thought where if it was a vertical strip, if they were doing damage and it was slowly over time washing down uh, without being caught, like if you had a big torrential downpour that just pulled it uh, versus on edge where it may be like a steps over time, like a yeah. terrace in a way. Um, but then you'd have to rewrite all your lines and yeah. it'd be a whole, depending on what the geography looks like, it may be impractical. And we, we too have, I mean, they're running in pretty dense forest. Of course, the undergrowth is getting knocked out, but we have, oh, yeah. during the fall and the winter, we have all the leaf clutter that falls back down. Yep. There's yep. lots of saplings and trees and yep. lots of undergrowth, silver pine, we call it, or something yep. that kind of grows under there. So yep. it comes back pretty quick. Does it? That's yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, as long as you get that growth, and that's what I was thinking um, kind of a long way around, yeah. was that you have a longer season, so it seems like that could actually come back it does. quicker. Yeah, it does. Yeah. We don't really have that months of period where there's no growth. Right. Really. We don't have a lot of growth. We still even have a little bit of growth in October yep. and November. Yep. And then we go through those two or three months where there's not very much. Yep. Um, our biggest problem is not that it freezes and then falls, is that we'll have a freeze for a week, 
thaw for a week, oh. and then we get muddy. Yeah. And then it freezes back up, and we get muddy. Oh yeah, again, that's a mess. And it just makes for a horrible mess. Yeah, that's where I like, see like once we kind of we kind of had that in that two month spring and fall, yeah. and then once it's solid, it's solid. Yeah. Like they can go wherever they want. No shoes. The, the grass they can be walking over the grass all winter, and it's fine. Yeah. It's once it starts to thaw, then they clean it all out. Yeah, and I think about the so. On that side of my land, I got about 15 acres, and it's all these great big oaks, you know, but it is a steep drop, and yeah. I've wanted to put them out there so many times, but there's not really grasses. There's some brambles here and there, um, some forbs, little spruce and firs and stuff, and a lot of slash where they logged in the past, but not a lot of grass. Mostly it's the leaf litter on the top, and once I put them out there, uh, and they turn over that leaf litter, some grasses would come up. Yeah, you'll get those natural grasses yep. over there. But I'd have to do it like in a period where the growth is really happening. Yeah. Like it's like a very small window I have to get them in there, have them turn it over, get the seeds to it, and then get them off it again so the grass can actually come back, or else I have bare soil. Yeah. So I've thought about it, and I just haven't put them over there yet just because of the You'll get a lot of mast off those oaks as well, which yep. is amazing. And yep. they, in the woods, I don't know what they get, but mm -hmm. they get lots of forage. Mm -hmm. I mean, mushrooms and... Yeah beetles and yep. larva and grubs and yep. leaves, you know, mm -hmm. briars. They love it. They are munching <laughs> on it all the time. Um, but if you had that area, I mean, like, you could run them through that timber, yeah. timbered area and actually they would do some work for you too, well, clearing that out. 100%. So when, I, when we bought the place, they had logged it like two years before. And so the majority of the land um, is a new growth. There's slash piles everywhere and all the breakdown from the compost and all the bugs and the worms and the brambles that are coming up. They would love that. Remember we had a forester out here from the university and he was uh, super upset. He's like, oh, everything's been stripped. He was almost like, it's like worthless. Yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? There's like a pig, pig there's like, I couldn't ask for a better piece Fair of land. Enough, yeah. Like I don't have pastures, but like for pigs, like this is perfect. Yeah. There's gonna be years of that carbon material breaking down, like slash, there'll be, you know, a decade of brambles coming up and then that new growth coming up. I'm like, this is actually wonderful. We have beet hazelnut popping up. It's like, yeah. but that different perspective where the forest is like, oh, there's no value here. You're not going to see any return for years on yeah. your timber. I'm like, well, I'm not really, you know, growing right. timber. I need firewood and pigs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the, I want to ask you about your shirt also. The North Carolina yep. farmer, is that something you made or is that no, a it was group? A, it was a... It was a friend. This I think she found it in a store somewhere. Oh, okay. She bought it for me. I just thought it was probably you know, yeah. pretty cool. Sure, yeah. representing North yeah, Carolina. Represent. I like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, there's something like a group down there or something. Or no, like not that somewhere. I'm aware of. Any, yeah. You know, I just kind of bought it at one of the local sporting <laughs> stores. <laughs> I just thought it was pretty cool. So, what's next for Seven Stands Farm? Like, where do you, oh, you guys have got the bees? You got the goats? I don't get the think. Pigs? I, at this point, I think as far as new innovations, mm -hmm. we're pretty we're pretty set. Stick probably just looking to maybe expanding the things you've got. Yeah, we're You're saying the market's going pretty well. We've expanded a little bit into poultry with some friend farmers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've got more pasture land, so uh, we buy chickens with them and and we help them with processing, and then they move the chickens daily, you know, yeah. just a daily yeah. move in just a few minutes. So. Like a salad and style. Yeah, kind salad of and style. Yep. Uh, so they're doing the daily moves and we're, of course, paying for the chicks and our part of the feed. And then when mm -hmm. it comes to processing, we're there with the processing. So yeah. we've eased into that and chicken's doing real well for us. But, you know, maybe just increasing pigs and we may be, we may almost be topping out at that just because yeah. of time. I get it. You know what I mean? As long as we're working full time, we're just about, you know, we're about yeah. topped out. Well, I, that's one of the things I like about your channel too, um, is because you and your wife are working full time, and you've got all these enterprises on the farm, which I think a lot of people run into. Um, I have my wildlife control business, but I'm still in control of my hours. Yeah. You know, and what I have is boom and bust cycles. Yeah. Um, spring, animals come out of the woodwork. Yeah. You know, your raccoons and your bats. And so I have peaks and then uh, valleys. You know, yeah. The middle of winter and the middle of summer, it's quiet. Spring and fall, it's crazy. Yeah. Which coincides with the farm. So it's a pretty wild time. <laughs> you know, it's a pretty wild time. Yeah. So I really like that. Um, I've been watching your stuff over the last, you know, whatever it's been, a month or two yeah. months, whatever. The, uh, 
because you've got the full-time jobs and you're trying to expand on that farm and it is growing. Yeah. You know, it sounds like it's getting much bigger, especially with the market. Yeah, the market's doing great for yep. us. Yeah, I definitely, and it's tough too because you see these opportunities like um, the, the processing. When you have an opportunity when there's a, everyone can work together, you know, you're giving up a day. Yeah. You know, or maybe a couple of days for all that process and stuff, yeah. which isn't bad when you look at your return on all your chickens, yeah. but it still costs a day. Yeah. You know, and there's only so many days we've got ahead. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of see where that goes, but I think that's going to be very relatable to a lot of people. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, you good? Jeez, what else? I probably have a million other questions, oh, yeah. but I'll think about them later on. Yeah, exactly. That'd be <laughs> me. I should have asked him something when we were at his farm, but yeah. So do you want. Um, to send folks to your channel, do you want me to send them off to you? Uh, you do you have any, you have any closing thoughts? No, huh? I'm, I'm, I just thank you for allowing us to come out. I yeah, mean, yeah. You know, somebody you never really talked to shouts you an email <laughs> from North Carolina and says, hey, can we come see your pigs? I know that's kind of an odd probably well, thing at first. No, we're, I was actually pretty excited because I seen a bunch of your channel things you're doing. I was like, oh, that'd be awesome. Okay, a good. A chance to uh, talk and see how things go down there and just get that other perspective from other places. Cool. So I love it. That's what so, I thought, too. Yeah. So any of you guys that are listening, check out Jamie at Seven Stands Farm. I'll add links to everything. And uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, guys. See you later. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, man. Appreciate it. You're